Hi, I'm Rachel. I use she, her pronouns, and I am here to welcome you to our at-home Sunday meeting. The cool thing about this meeting is that you don't have to watch it at home. You can be part of creating this time together wherever you are, whether you're taking a walk through a park, whether you're in the car or in your office like I am, or whether you're at somebody else's house right now, you are part of this meeting that we are creating together. The pandemic has really given us a larger sense of who we are around the world based on what God is doing. And so Circle of Hope isn't just a church, a local church in Philadelphia and South Jersey anymore. We're connected through our partners everywhere. So I'm glad you're here, and let me introduce you to our other hosts here today. Hi, I am Danny Morrisberger, and I will be one of your hosts for tonight. I'm excited to see you guys in the after -head. My name is Robert, and I'll be one of your hosts for the at-home Sunday meeting. Thanks, Danny and Robert. I want to invite us all to actually participate in this meeting, not just watch it, but participate. And so if you're watching the premiere, at five o'clock Eastern Standard Time, you can get in the live chat function on YouTube and introduce yourself, sign in please, and introduce yourself there and you can talk to other people throughout this meeting because we're really making this meeting together with God. We're in a new season here today called Begin Again Again. And it came about because we're acknowledging that we kind of have to begin again. The pandemic, has kind of forced us into a season of learning a new way of being all over the world. And so we are looking to Jesus for that. We're fixing our eyes on Jesus this season to learn this new way of living in faith. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the author or pioneer or trailblazer of our faith, the one who carves out a new path or a new beginning for us. And so we're starting a new journey here tonight with Jesus. I hope that you're part of that too. At least the openness is there that we, we can start something new together. And we're gonna have some space for music and worship and meditation. Um, a little poetry, and then our pastor Ben is going to bring us a message um, de describing Jesus actually in a moment of calling people into that new beginning. And so I hope that you feel invi invited too, because I think that Jesus is inviting all of us to begin again, again. Holy Spirit, come to us kindle in us the fire of your love holy spirit come to us holy spirit come to us
In the beginning, not in time or space, but in the quick, before both space and time, in life, in love, in coherent grace, in three in one, in one in three, in rhyme, in music, in the whole creation story, in his own image, his imagination, the triune poet makes us for his glory and makes us each the other's inspiration. He calls us out of darkness, chaos, chance, to improvise a music of our own, to sing the chord that calls us to the dance, three notes resounding from a single tone, to sing the end in whom we all begin our God beyond, beside us, and within.
it's time to begin again with Jesus. With Jesus, it might be that time at all times. A time when a man who has grown old can be born again. A time when a woman who is well past her years of birthing, whether she birthed from her womb or not, is ready to birth something newer than ever. Whenever Jesus is there, new creation is here, Paul exclaims in his letter to the Corinthians. We are a Jesus people, so we are working to embrace this ever newness with our whole lives. But this is not easy. Not everything changes quickly. All transformative growth takes time. I know this because I don't change very quickly. If I were to say that I am born again, which I do, I, I could not tell you exactly when it happened. But if I look at myself in my journal 10 years ago, the change is undeniable. The, the newness came through many beginnings, not just one moment. And I think you can probably feel me on this. Jesus came preaching a simple message, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. We ruined the word repent by heaping a bunch of shame and guilt on it. Uh, so it's kind of lost all the fun that might have been in it. Uh, it conjures up the end more than the beginning. Repent, for the end is near. You've seen that sign, right? You may have heard this a million times, but I'm going to keep saying it a million times. Repent just means change. It doesn't mean feel bad for what you did. It means do something different now that you know that what you did makes you feel bad. The conviction of sin lasts a moment, long enough for you to change directions. Repent is about turning to Jesus, calibrating and moving in his direction. Repentance is about beginning again, again, and then beginning again, 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 again. I'm going to keep saying that. A mature person in Christ is able to accept failure, receive grace, and move on in hope. This stage of the pandemic that we're in gives us a great opportunity to begin again, again, and to begin again, again. Because we can't just keep carrying on. We can't just keep calm and pretend like nothing has happened. Like we used to be able to, maybe. We cannot keep doing exactly what we did yesterday because today is indeed so different. And this is probably true every day, but gradual changes, they're harder to notice. Spending a year indoors, completely changing our routines, it gives this fresh perspective on our lives as they were and as they are now. So let's not waste the opportunity to this big disruption to see things differently. Let's begin again, again. What better way to begin with Jesus than to, to watch him beginning? Over the next several weeks here in our At Home Sunday meeting, we'll be looking at Jesus' origin stories. Uh, there are four Gospels, and we'll look at the beginning of them mostly to watch Jesus begin stuff. Our, our theme verse is Hebrews 12, 2. We must look ahead to Jesus. He is the one who carved out the path for faith, and he is the one who completed it. We'll look ahead to Jesus, who has been through all the things that we've been through, and follow his example as best we can. His followers gave us a lot to work with in the Gospels. Let's start with Mark. That's the one that people who study the Bible think was written first. Uh, it's like a no-nonsense, quick story. And my favorite fun fact about Mark is that everything happens immediately. Immediately is like Mark's favorite word. The Greek word for immediately is euthis. And it's used 59 times in the New Testament. And uh, of those 59 times, 58 of them occur in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And of those 58, 41 of them are in the book of Mark. This word is euthis. 41 times. It's like, Mar like Mark's Gospel might be the book of euthis. Things are happening immediately. I read that this might be because Mark was trying to demonstrate the uh, obedience of Jesus to the Father. He's just doing it immediately. It has this sense of urgency and direct connection with God's big plan for transformation for the whole world. I really like that uh, explanation, but Mark doesn't make himself clear as to why he's doing this. So it's not, it's not possible to know. But I do think that there's a connection between uh, obedience and immediacy about doing things ASAP. Um, Obeying, because obeying Jesus, obeying anything, is hard. It's hard to push against um, my, my self-absorption uh, 
or my forgetfulness or the resistance that I encounter. So obeying Jesus, following Jesus is hard. So doing something immediately, if I have some sense of it's what I ought to do, is probably best. And I've experienced it as, the, as one of the best ways to obey. Jesus, in the story that I want to tell here in Mark 1, 16 through 20, tells these four people to follow him. He says, follow me, and they do it immediately. Um, I, I really like that, and I think that it, it, it speaks to um, what it's like to, to try to follow. Um, and following, I think, is one way to be new, even when things don't seem to have changed dramatically. I'll say more about that soon, but let's look at here what happens on the seashore in Galilee, Mark 1, 16 through 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Wow, what the heck? How does this happen? One minute they're doing their jobs and the next minute they're doing something completely different. They're dropping everything. Taking this story by itself, uh, we could get a lot of inspiration from Simon, Andrew, James, and John for how they immediately just drop everything. Wow, that's some obedience, right? I see a similar moment in this season uh, of beginning that we're in, beginning again, again. The, the nets that we were holding before the pandemic, we might need to drop those. Uh, we might have been forced to drop them already. And, and now that it's time to maybe pick them back up again, we have this moment to consider, well, maybe I shouldn't pick all that up again. Maybe I don't have to be exactly how I was. Maybe I could be new because I can't be old in many ways. One of the few benefits of this disorienting time is that it's obvious that yes, things do change. Things do not have to stay the same. That means that you too could be new. If only because you can't be the old way um, that you used to be. So we've got this chance to drop our nets and follow Jesus in a new way. And this could be exciting. It's also terrifying, but it could be exciting. However, there's a bit more to this story. Before we get too down on ourselves for a pretty tight grip on those nets, the life that we live, the routines that we have, the patterns of thoughts and behaviors that make us feel comfortable, before you count yourself out, because dropping everything like Simon, Andrew, James, and John just seems impossible to you, let's take a look at John 1. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist this time, John the Baptist, again, was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here's the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. There's the more information. Uh, these fishermen were looking for the Messiah. They were desperate for things to change in their lives and in the life of their people. The Jews had been under the boot of some empire for hundreds of years, almost without reprieve. The Romans taxed their colonies mercilessly and enforced their will via brutal strategies like crucifixion. Simon, Andrew, James, and John were really ready to drop their nets because their fishing life was next to impossible. We see here in John that Andrew was also a follower of John the Baptist before he followed Jesus. And John had a very similar message to Jesus. He preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Andrew followed him, was definitely baptized by him, though the story doesn't really tell us that, and listened to John talk about the coming Messiah. And then he actually listens to him say, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Andrew had some inside information. He had already followed Jesus at this moment when he and Peter um, uh, get this call to be his disciples. 
This is like a this is like a formal call. Come be my disciple. Follow me. Be on my team. I'm choosing you for my squad. That's why they drop everything because they're ready for this moment and they're excited for the new thing they're going to do. They're going to follow Jesus. They're going to obey his way. And to oversimplify it, uh, they follow him around doing a lot of normal stuff, talking about the Hebrew scriptures, which were already really old at that point. And yet everything is new. When Jesus says, follow me, it's not all miracles and big speeches. It's a lot of doing dishes and walking and waiting to see what he's going to do next. And it's like that for us too. When you start following Jesus or start following Jesus again, your life does not always dramatically change. It, it might feel dramatically different. Even if the kids still have to be at the bus stop at a certain time and your boss still needs that project completed and your mom still does that thing that makes you feel small and your friend is still sick and so on and so on. Even when many things do not change, you change. And a great way to get in touch with that change, to experience that knowledge of the transformation, I am a new creation, is to live differently, to obey Jesus, to follow him. Do something because Jesus told you. Do it immediately. It, it's even better if it's the same old thing as it ever was, but now you're doing it with this new sense of purpose. You're beginning again, again. We can do that as, as people with Jesus. We can begin again, again. So uh, love your neighbor. <laughs> not, it's not news, but do it because Jesus told you to. Begin again, again. Be gentle. It's not news, but do it because Jesus told you to. Begin again, again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Worship God. It's not news, but do it because Jesus told you to. Begin again, again. I want to end with a bit of a parable from literature. Julio Cortazar was this Argentine author in the 20th century that was very influential. And this passage called Instructions for Climbing the Stairs is a bit like um, that feeling of beginning again, again. Can I, can, I, can I approach climbing the stairs like it's new? Can I approach this life of mine like it's new? I think that this is kind of fun, this, this, uh, this uh, little couple paragraphs that Julio Cortazar wrote, and I hope you can have fun with it because I want you to have fun with this project of being new. Repent is just turning towards Jesus, y'all. We're beginning again, again. We have this opportunity to be new in our whole country, in our whole world. Um, let's do it together. And let's have maybe some excitement in it because Jesus is here with us, cheering us on and showing us where to go. So let's climb the stairs with Julio Cortazar. There is no one who hasn't observed that frequently the, for the floor will fold in such a manner that one part of it rises at a right angle with the plane of the floor. And later, the following part is placed in a parallel manner to this plane, giving way to a new perpendicular. And that this conduct repeats as a spiral or a broken line up to an extremely variable height. Each one of these footholds formed along the way by two elements is situated equally higher and more forward than the former, a principle that gives meaning to the staircase. Since whatever other combination will produce a form perhaps more beautiful or picturesque, but incapable of translating the lower floor to the upper floor, stairs are climbed from the front, since climbing them from behind or the side will result particularly uncomfortably. The natural attitude consists in maintaining oneself on one's feet, the arms loosely hanging at the side, the head erect but not so much so that the eye stops seeing those elevated footholds immediately to the one that is being tread upon and breathing slowly and regularly. In order to climb a staircase, one commences by raising that portion of the body situated at the below right, covered almost always in leather or rubber and almost without exception, fits exactly upon the foothold. Said part being placed upon the first foothold, and in order to abbreviate, we will hitherto call it foot, the equivalent part on the left is then removed, also called foot, but one must not confuse it with the aforementioned foot, and raising it to the height of the foot. It is to be made to follow until it is placed upon the second foothold, upon which the foot may now rest, and upon the first the other foot may rest. 
The first footholds are always the most difficult until acquiring the necessary coordination. The coincidence of the name between foot and foot make the explanation difficult. Be especially careful to not raise the foot and the foot at the same time. Arriving in this manner to the second foothold, it is enough to alternate the movement until one finds oneself at the end of the stairs. One can easily leave them with a light blow of the heel that fixes it in place, from which it shall not move until the moment of descent. <laughs> Thank you, Julio Cortazar. I love it, and I love you too. Let's keep talking about this in the afterhang on Zoom. We talk about everything, and I want to talk about you with this. What do you think? Um, and, and if you're not watching live, drop me a line at ben at circleofhope.net and I'll respond to you or put a comment in the YouTube uh, video and uh, I'll be looking for you there as well. Thanks, now. Ben. I love how you noted that as you looked over your journal of the past 10 years, that you could see that your transformation came through many new beginnings. And I think that's how it is for each of us. Our transformation is not a one-time thing. It's not even a linear event. It comes through turning to Jesus again and again and again right now. So I wanna invite you to do that here with us uh, by signing into this meeting. Um, you could also be part of a smaller group of us that meets throughout the week. Um, we call these groups cells, like cells of the body. And we have several online groups. And so you could be part of one no matter where you live in the world, if you can connect to the internet and you can find the, all, the list of all those cells on our website, circleofhope.church. You could also share resources with us through your website. You could support this ongoing mis mission through our website, circleofhope.church. There's a link for sharing. And finally, there's an afterhang. Every Sunday evening, Eastern Standard Time, we meet on Zoom after this, after this premiere from 545 to 615, and it gives us a chance to talk to each other face to face um, and to meet each other and get to know each other as people. So I wanna invite you to that time, and I just wanna leave you with the practical blessing that Ben gave us there at the end of his message. He said that um, God is immediately ready to receive us again and again. Like, the, like Mark's gospel is always immediate. And I think the message there is that God, God is immediately here. God is present and God is immediately ready to receive us. And what Jesus might be inviting us to do might be the same old thing that you've always been invited to do and that's okay because you're being invited to do it with a new sense of purpose and ben gave us the um suggestions to love our neighbors to be gentle with ourselves and with others and to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and so I invite you here today to begin again, again, in all those ways. God bless you.